Hey. Hey. What's up, guys? Hello. Going well. How are you guys? It's good. good. <laughs> nice to finally uh, meet people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice to see some faces. How are we doing, everybody? Hey, Tyler. Oh, you're hey, growing hey, a hey. beard? Tyler. No, this is literally just like a, not even a week of not shaving. <laughs> it's just, this coming. just needs, it just needs a shave is all it is. It's, it's stubble, it's all lies. Cool, cool. New faces I see, new names. <laughs> oh. Oh. Let's do this eight o'clock at night on a Friday. <laughs> dedication. <laughs> yep, exactly. All right. I let me ping people actually, because I completely forgot. I usually tag people on the channel. Life easier and open a fresh browser just so I can deal with the link. All right, we still have some coming in, but I think we can actually start. So I prepared a, a quick agenda uh, for us to, to start with. And the, the first item here is actually discussing the progress with the use cases that Nicole um, uh, came up with. So maybe Nicole, you can uh, share your screen and actually go um, you know, through the document uh, mm -hmm. for people that haven't seen it yet and kind of give the, the overall um, idea of um, the, the purpose and what we should be contributing to this document. Yeah, sure. Um, just give me a second to share my screen. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, can everyone see it clearly? Yep. Yep. Maybe you can okay. put the zoom in. Uh, All right. The on the left, there is this hundred percent left. Um, on the left. And bar. Yeah. There is hundred percent. If you can make it like two hundred percent. Oh, is uh, this something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the next text. Oh, you can do it this way. Okay. Okay. So basically, what I started to um. I started this Google Doc to get started on coming up with uh, potential use cases. Um, in the beginning, I just copied and pasted these notes from the Slack. These were notes from the product ideation call um, a week ago. And let's see. Well, the main point I was like particularly looking at was this first point, um, especially how we need to start being fo uh, focused on coming up with potential use cases for researchers who would use this tool. And I briefly talked with uh, Akansha about this. She reached out to me one day um, asking me if there was any um, help needed on the UX side. And she has some, she told me that she has some research lab experience. Uh, and it nice. was, she would, def yeah. And then, um, so I figured that it would be definitely, it definitely would be useful to have people uh, with research lab experience to help um, us in coming up with these potential use cases. And let's see. And um, the next section is Google Blogs. I came up with these like use case examples. These were mostly for not for our benefit, not, not just for our benefit, but also for mine, just because I don't have that much experience with delving into um, use cases. Um, but just just for you know, just to give an overview of like what it could possibly look like for people who are not uh, for, for people who are not familiar with uh, use, uh, doing use cases. For, for example, this is just a very basic use case for doing laundry. You have the um, the specific use case or the specific situation in which a, um, a product could be used or a platform could be used to achieve a certain goal. And then of course you have the actor who is um, performing this use case. And then of course you have the basic flow in which, uh, or the basic flow in which like there are certain steps that are implemented for this person, this actor to perform this uh, use case. Um, and in the next section we have the List of possible use cases for this AI literature review tool. Um, so I came up with a suggestion here, but I'll explain it now. So my suggestion is that as we're coming up with these use cases, um, 
it may be useful to not only outline the user flow for the ideal, like our ideal um, AI literature review tool for Corona Y, but also outlining the steps that would be um, used to perform this use case on, for example, like the Lion um, tool or also on PubMed. So for example, just to say- um, So like, so in that sense, it's like a competition analysis as well, just yeah. in like certain use flows, basically. Right, yeah. And that's, I haven't thought about it that way, but that's actually a good point. It could also be like a way to um, and like analyze how these different like flows like stack against each other. So let's just say, for example, like we're, we're talking about the use, the, this use case, uh, which was like pointed out earlier over here in the notes. Um, like a potential use case to, would be to identify which parts of a paper would include like specific um, relevant search terms. So, so we have that use case and we have the actor or the user who's the, um, the researcher. So, for, um, so here we would outline like the user flow for how we would use the AI literature review tool, like our ideal user flow and steps for um, this tool. And next we could like, out, um, we could perform the same use case, but on the Lion tool and the same with PubMed. And the benefit, I think the benefit of doing that would be, you know, we can identify certain commonalities in these steps and then that would trigger or instill like certain um, infrastructure requirements, which is like also noted in the product ideation notes. Um, not only that, but we could also see what are, what are some certain steps that work for the platforms, like um, in terms of the user experience or what are certain steps that don't work. Um, uh, it's just like a way to sort of like, you know, especially like since we are um, specifically interested in the Lion uh, tool, this may be a useful thing to like note, like just identifying the certain steps that will be done on here and also on like PubMed and then what are, what is our ideal flow for this as well. And then it would just be a good way to like sort of uh, have everything laid out and- when it, when it comes to, when it comes to informing what you're describing as the ideal flow, um, how, how do we, how are we going to go about finding out the ideal flow? Because that's kind of based on user research that we don't have yet. Yeah, right, I think yeah. the best way would be to actually form a group that would be ideally facilitated by Dan Sosa. Uh, and I'm sure he can bring a couple of other people from his research lab. But we also have uh, Ankasha, right, and Anu, uh, that actually came to us with, with very specific research background that we can, you know, tailor to their needs at first. Because Ankasha was, is the person that actually did manual literature reviews, right? Uh, she, she was the person that, you know, did probably thousands of, of these when working in the lab. Right, yeah, it would definitely be useful to, um, start by like getting like user research on like how um, certain re like researchers like would perform like uh, how they would like perform these use cases on like different platforms and then maybe in a way we could see like ask them like what works for them what are they used to especially since like if they if these researchers are used to using certain platforms and tools um, it would be important to consider those because maybe like you know if they're used to like using those certain tools and like the, um, the certain elements that these tools have. It may be important to consider that when we are coming up with like the ideal user flow for uh, the literature review tool. Um, but yeah, like when it comes to this over here, this is, pro this is most likely a step that's done later. Maybe it'll be good to focus on this and also the user research um, so that we can come up with what is an ideal user, fl user flow for these use cases. When it comes to using research, that's kind of my understanding is you've got to come up with the concept and then work out the competition within the concept of what you're trying to solve and if there's other people doing that. Mm -hmm. And then once you've got them concepts and then other things that already exist within the space, then you get user research against the things that already exist to try and understand, you know, pain points that the people, people run into, you know, the way that they are, you know, this is, what they do like about it, what they don't like about it, what works for them, what doesn't work. And then we take that information and inform a flow. And then we work out a user story and a, a user flow 
in the sense that how people are going to flow through the tool, different versions of these different flows. And then once we've got a number of these different flows, we can start working out how that we would build that in, into actual. That's kind of my thoughts on the process right now. But it's, per I mean, it's perfectly fine to have a space for this like ideal, ideal quote unquote, but um, we need to, we need more information yet for still. I think we're still, there's still so little information that, that we have partially because it doesn't exist and partially because we're kind of taking a, you know, like you say, what Lion's been doing a little bit and what PubMed does and what like manual literature review tools, and well, people, when they do manual literature review, um, they already do, you know, they'll open a spreadsheet and they'll copy this and they'll copy this and they'll copy that and they'll make notes for themselves. We're trying to work out how they do that so we can take some of that work away from them. But we also, like there's the technical side of what needs to be, what are the kind of things that they want to have written there as well. So there's like a mixture of um, uh, architect. We need to understand like the architecture of how people think about the problem, like the the the, the different parameters, the different labels, the different uh, columns of information that they're pulling out and then what they want to do with like what is their end goal because the end idea is we need to try and solve their end goal which is extracting information as quickly and as efficiently as possible so that's kind of where we need to start from as much as like use cases is good i think we we need to get more research and more examples so yeah getting some research researchers to do test ideas against lion test ideas against pubmed in the that are kind of the same problem might inform us a bit better how to do an improved version of both of them things plus in, in interviewing them about how they actually do literature review that's definitely what we need to do with some of as well we need some call qual, qual, uh, on to, no, quality of data on how people actually do literature review i mean i watch my partner do it but she does it in psychology so it's not the same thing so my piece i'll let nicole finish Oh, no worries. I mean, I'm pretty much done like explaining this whole document, but yeah, I agree that um, the, user, the user research part of the whole like user experience process is like, I think that's just like a really important part of the process, especially since it's going to drive a lot of like the things that will, uh, all the different moves that we'll do throughout this whole process. And, you know, I did outline like, you know, the ideal like user flow over here, but of course this is something that's going to change like throughout as we keep doing like iterations and also um, as we Ideal imagined like, flow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so um, yeah, I was, is, do, and does anyone else have any questions or comments? I think we're good. I mean, this is pretty much the structure that we need to utilize to organize that uh, user research group. And maybe uh, since you, Nicole, have the, the most uh, kind of context here, you can basically prompt that. Uh, yeah, I think, Katie, we, we cannot hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. It's okay. I'm not, wait. Is it uh, difficult no, no. to hear me right now? We can hear you, Nicole, but. Um, oh. Uh, Scott Carlson, who is Katie Miller, but she's using another account, mm -hmm. and I was going to say that the use case three came from an earlier meeting. See three, yeah, um, and this use case came from a Rockefeller research group, and they pointed out that it would be great to see that because PubMed currently doesn't solve that for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what I was saying, uh, if you can prompt a call with An Ankasha, uh, Anu, and we have a couple of more researchers that Bianca can um, surface for you from our internal CRM. And let's just prompt a call and see. Well, I've, got, I've got a channel with all the UX people in them already. Oh, nice. Uh, what's the name of the channel? Team UX, easy as that. Yeah, nice. Uh, I've, I've, but I went through, I went for the CRM and found pretty much anyone with UX, design UX, that sort of user experience, that kind of stuff. No, no, I, I, put I mean, one, I put uh, them all in one space, basically. I mean, not UX people, but the actual researchers, because uh, I mean, uh, that is the, the hard part, because we yeah. need to organize a call 
And the call, trust me, that's going to be the only viable channel to extract feedback. They're not going to oh, yeah. write emails to us. They're not going to, uh, you know, comment on our Google Docs. We just need to jump on the call, dedicate an hour and have this, um, you know, I recently learned this uh, phrase from Jack Park, um, the, the notion of Bohmian bomb, dialogue, you know, just, you know, bumping uh, into each other and, and having a, a, a conversation without a specific goal, but sharing the thoughts and uh, ideas on certain aspects of the topic. So let's prompt that call. Um, I'll ping Bianca. She was not able to join this call uh, now, but uh, she'll help uh, find all the researchers in our existing team. And I can also reach out to Rockefeller researchers to join that call too. All right, so that sounds good. Uh, Kathy says, PubMed doesn't help find things in different parts of the paper. She was saying that it matters if it comes from background rather than from discussion or analysis or conclusion, right? So actually indicating that occurrence of the terms or direction of uh, specific direction of research and where it shows up in the paper. Because, yeah, if you go into PubMed and you uh, basically, let me share my screen real quick. Um, if you type in um, coronavirus, uh, if I can only spell uh, elderly, there is no way, oh, now there is a way. I think that's a new feature that they, they added, but also you can't see the method or like the specific sections of the paper, like whether it's in methodology or conclusion or, you know, all those um, very dynamic sections of the paper that uh, researchers use to structure their research. So um, yeah, this is something that definitely has to exist. And something that we actually are very capable of creating, by the way. I'll let you, Nicole, uh, proceed. Oh, uh, no, I mean, this is basically, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, wait, no, my screen's not sharing, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I mean, those are basically the thoughts I have so far on, um, in terms of like, the progress with these cases. Um, but yeah, the a good first step was, would be to just start delving into like the user research aspect. Um, and I'll, I will be happy to like participate in that call with like getting in touch with like researchers. Um, I do wonder if, so I'm, ass I'm assuming that users, uh, the main, our main target users would be, um, you know, medical researchers. But I think I saw somewhere within the Slack channel that we could, um, this tool could be also used for um, like policymakers or, yeah. you know, just, some people who are also outside of like the whole research, like medical uh, research. Um, I think I think we should get the medical one side first done right, right, and then and then if we get that right, other other professionals <laughs> might be interested in it. But it needs to get it needs to get that side right first because they're like target number one. They're the ones that we're going to be. Yeah, right. being, they're going to be getting the most utility from it in the long term. And yeah, they're like. Um, like health, like public health specialists and that sort of stuff might be interested in it at some point, but um, literature review is a very specific thing. So it's mm -hmm. kind of Yeah, the, the thing is that when we're dealing with uh, biomedical researchers, we're able to fine tune to very, very specific use cases. When we're dealing with the, uh, you know, policy makers, you, you know, like National Institute of Health or White House, um, there is so much diversity in different topics of research that they're exploring that it's almost impossible for us to tailor to something specific. So I agree with, uh, with Tyler that we should focus on the biomedical researchers first, and then we can expand to more, um, more diverse set of queries or research topics. Yeah, exactly. If we get that right, other people who it basically specialists we need to get it right for the specialists who are doing the specialist work and then the public health people which are generalists know something about it have some inf information but they're not that they're not the specialists doing the specialist research we need to get the specialists right and then 
if if he gets that right, then it'll be e it'll be like on a superficial level. We need to make sure he's on for the less specialist, but the specialist needs definitely needs to be targeted first for me. Like you know, paradox of specificity. We need to get that right, and hopefully it will be more useful across in other ways. But we need to make sure that's right. Otherwise, there's no point at all making it. Right. So basically, just you know, I think I did learn in school sometime. Uh, in time in school, like within like the UX process, we need to focus on more of like users with specific, I guess, specific circumstances, um, specific use cases, and you know you kind of start out very narrow, and then uh, eventually you start to discover like things that could be useful for you know for a, a wider audience. But yeah, it would. Yeah, I agree it's called, that it's called the paradox. Within UX, it's called the paradox of specificity. Mm -hmm. It's the idea right. that being very specific is unusual, but it actually is more usable if it does one thing right. You know, it's, it goes. It, it talks about luggage is the best example of it, but right. we don't need to go into that right now. Right. Yeah. Um, Keithy just asked about. At... Oh. Uh, Katie asked about the use case was angiotensin receptors. So that, that came from Anu Subramanian, and she's an um, uh, epidemiologist interested in pharma, pharma, pharmacoepidemiology, and she was interested in that. Uh, can we just use some of the original 68 or so questions the physicians gave us? So that's a great question. So we, we should definitely get back to the original questions that um, basically were created as an effort of Kaggle competition, but I think we can use them and create these kind of, I don't know, collections that address them in, in some way. So, especially since we already have somewhat uh, a proof of concept for the interface, uh, we were just demoing that to um, uh, Serge, uh, who is an epidemiologist by, by a, a degree and some experience. Um, and he was exploring that. And I actually think that it's, it's already a useful tool. So if we type in, let's say actually Andrew Tensin. All right, we have 447 papers, uh, 73 papers. We can filter by different journals, for example, Elsevier. Um, and we can filter by um, time series analysis. And here we go. We see some papers from um, China and we see very specific entities that were extracted like angiotensin converting enzyme, reading angiotensin system and things like that. So maybe actually we can send, uh, you know, recording of this video to Anu and uh, ask her if this is already useful in some form and that can be a very productive call to, to discuss what's missing or what's what's wrong in here. So this this section is kind of our, because we've got like a search section and an extraction section. That's kind of our two thoughts in it. We've got how to find the interesting bits you're interested in, and then how to then take the selection of things you found interesting and extract it into a table that you can then look at the summary of data and the summary of numbers, yeah? So this section, the search concept is already starting to come to fruition. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like um, on this tool, we're actually combining a search with this exploration and literature review tables, right? Because the named entity recognition part is, is exactly that. It's kind of like a extraction of things. So if we go back into, um, our Coronamad uh, portal, we can actually, let's say, we don't have anything on uh, angiotensin here, but we have something related to hypertension. So on hypertension, we can see all kinds of extra data that we've already extracted um, manually. So this table, if it loads, uh, will showcase sample size and very specific um, type of data that researchers understand and yeah like study type sample size and essentially what well, we can extend our proof of concept with more of these quantitative types of of data like sample size or um more 
more of like uh, descriptive things like study population and some in indicative metrics like critical only, only discharge versus death and things like that. Uh, the collections could be a kind of use case, but Chronomat is still manually created stuff, not NLP yet. Correct. So the current challenge is to actually bridge uh, the manual tables with the stuff that we have uh, done automatically. So Mike Honey actually took an initiative to put this proof of concept together, did an amazing job at aggregating all kinds of different sources and like name the entity recognition stuff. And I believe the next step would be to have him integrate some of the manually created data into this too. Do we want to be putting manually curated data into it? I think so. Uh, we wouldn't, just it, need... wouldn't, it, wouldn't it skew the data set? Well, th says... this is the, what we're showing researchers. This is not what we're training the the actual uh, machine learning models. So that process will be separate. Yeah, the manual set is the gold standard. The manual set is the thing that we're trying to emulate the output from, but with the AI NLP tools rather than obviously the manual process. So the idea is we try and mimic it and then expand on it is, the, is what we're trying to get to. Um, so, I mean, it's a good place to start. But it depends on that's like the back end stuff. I mean, that's NLP teams, and I mean, ties have done some, and VT have done some, and Risk have done some. But I don't know, Mike Honey's starting to like be part of the integrating these different tools that have been built into one. Yeah, and single, fascinatingly single enough, system. he actually participated in visualization of all of these teams. So when uh, yeah. Christine and her team submitted the round two challenge. These are actually created by Mike Honey and they extracted uh, some quantitative things like days and age and study type, sample size. And these things were created by NLP models. And I'm not sure if there's a good description of how these were created, but it's, it's in there. I'll, I'll send this link. Yeah. Yeah, there's, 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 there was a process and that's kind of what Ties mostly worked on was how to accurately make um, number extractions, yeah. How long people were in hospital, these kind of number related questions and number. Related. Um, so who, who's going to be organizing, like bringing all these tools together and making them all work and stay in loop because don't know who's doing that right now. Is Great question. Anton, I, is Anton doing that or just Mike or? And actually is Alex, Slava, is involved? Slava is joining us right now. So I think the question is, is to him actually. Hi Slava. Yep. Hi guys. So I just joined and uh, I already have questions. <laughs> Perfect timing. Yes, you do. <laughs> nice. Perfect timing. Actually, we were just starting to talk about the uh, the hardware behind the AI and the AI and LLP technology behind the literature mm -hmm. review tool, because I don't okay. I don't fully understand who's running that right now. I know you're running the infrastructure, but I don't know who's integrating all the different code that's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you just want to know how how actually it works, right? And who's making it work <laughs> as well? Like okay, I know, magic. I know there's, I know there's like, I understand the different like systems Aries. that are going into it, but I just don't understand mm -hmm. who's actually doing all the building of the all the different disparate tools that have been built and making them all work together. Yeah, I still don't, I don't even know who's doing that yet. Okay, so so uh, I will try to explain. So we have uh, common components uh, like Elasticsearch, MongoDB, and uh, a lot of uh, other tools. And uh, if you'll open a, a list of services from Coronavai website, uh, we updated mm -hmm. recently, you'll find uh, more than 20 uh, such services. So um, all, um, all stuff actually goes from, um, from Jupyter notebooks that uh, we created uh, um, at Coronavai. 
in different co-op environments. And uh, basically, it's not only COVID-19, but also other data sets like Altmetrics and, uh, um, well, daily statistics and this kind of stuff. So recently, um, we created a um, uh, RESTful API that actually allows to interact with all services as, uh, as kind of uh, one integrated service. So you don't see if it's uh, Elastic or if, if it's Mongo, if it's Dataverse or something else actually is behind, but you can just um, make request and get some data. And uh, now basically we are busy with uh, documentation. So of course now it's very um, limited and uh, after we'll provide uh, examples what you can get from this API endpoint and how to actually uh, to integrate in, in, in uh, applications. So uh, this uh, infrastructure is kind of common component that can be integrated in any vertical project. So if you need some something from Core 19, you can easily just uh, uh, use some, some methods from uh, our RESTful API and you can get uh, this data inside of um, your tool as JSON, which is kind of like common thing for any web application. Um, so if you need to add something more, so you, you can also provide um, notebook to us and uh, we actually will integrate it inside of the API. So this is flexibility of the infrastructure that we are actually creating. Um, we can actually get all customized blocks easily uh, inside of uh, like common thing and uh, everybody can reuse it. Not only this vertical team, that requested this change, but also other teams. And uh, for, for, for example, for Dataverse, it will allow us to read any data set that people will upload in Dataverse. And it can be shared with uh, any, um, any partner, even outside of uh, CoronaVite. So it doesn't matter who will read it. We just need uh, transparent statistics showing who is actually using this uh, endpoint or infrastructure. Uh, and uh, we just need to authenticate these users because okay. we don't want to abuse our services. Obviously, yeah. so okay, cool. The way I'm how I see it, uh, because we already have an integration part called Dataverse and it has API endpoint with tokens. So we can arrange tokens for anybody with account on Dataverse. And after we'll be able to track any usage of uh, our infrastructure doesn't matter if it's Elastic or Mongo or something else, we'll see it and uh, we'll be able to provide and grant access to some uh, specific data sets if it's required. Even if some data um, uploaded to our infrastructure will be sensitive. That so, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So I, I actually have a a question that uh, builds on top of Tyler's question. So we obviously have all the pieces, we have the API and there has to be someone kind of like taking pieces together and piecing them to together, which is uh, what Mike Honey kind of did for the proof of concept, but I think he needs help. So maybe people like Alex that had some interaction with Christine's um, you know, code can actually help Mike Honey organize and include that sample size, you know, study type and other things within the proof of concept. I think that that would be an easy next step. Oh yeah, uh, well, what I forgot to mention, actually NLP pipeline is already integrated in our infra infrastructure as well. So if you'll go to um, a list of services or you, you can just go to GitHub repository for coronavirus infrastructure, uh, you will find um, a pipeline uh, let me check how it's called. But actually, uh, you can just deploy it on, on Amazon or Google Cloud and run. And you can get up-to-date results from Core 19. And of course, you need quite a um, good server behind or cloud because it, it takes too much time at the moment. It was very I was, that was literally going to be my next question, um, wondering how so long we take now to process. And to run uh, different containers for 
uh, so we are trying to uh, optimize now and uh, we'll try, for example, to create 100 containers and every container will be responsible for processing a specific part. And if it will be not enough in terms of time, we'll create 1000 containers. And it's only, of course, it's cost money, but uh, this is necessary thing to do. And uh, it will be a really uh, like parallel processing and we'll be able to scale up in any infrastructure, it doesn't matter if it's Google or uh, uh, Microsoft Azure or Amazon, whatever. It should be just Kubernetes. So this is why it takes um, quite a long time, but uh, I think we are making progress and uh, probably like uh, in August, we'll be able to provide production ready uh, solution that everybody can just run and get um, up to date data because I see it as, as a main bottleneck for uh, coronavirus at the moment. Yeah. Alex, I'm going to say something, so. Oh, no, I, I was just, I was just going to make sure that Slava got the, the models uh, from, from the team, just to say that I, I thought we already uploaded them, but he explained that and I see that they're in the, in the GitHub. So we're good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, um, um, yeah, it's another extension that we try to implement, but unfortunately, we're busy with uh, optimization. So we want to read all uh, custom models from uh, whatever source and also to apply to a pipeline. Yeah. Um, this is next steps. Uh, has anybody got any questions so far? I imagine some of the newer people have probably got some questions. Now is definitely the time to ask rather than pretend like you're fine. <laughs> oh yeah, I see question when, how exactly can uh, UX designers contribute? All right, so here comes the next point on the agenda, discussing the <laughs> current progress um, with mock-ups that Yuan created. So I think this is your your time, um, Peter, right? Uh, yeah, so I, I just opened the mockups and maybe Yuan, you can actually share your screen and kind of walk us through the current progress and um, sh show where we should be able to contribute. I'll let you share your screen. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So, um, I created this very basic wireframe um, under this impression that it is meant for a wider audience, including policy makers and non-professionals like me. So I was very trying to make it as beginner friendly as possible, trying to give it a sense of clarity. Um, so it was basically a brand of these two search engines, the PubMed and the Lion Projects. And then I basically tried to um, split that into two search categories. One of the articles ones, which is the research papers and the graph, meaning the things like Lion Project, like showing the interrelations of different terms. Um, so yeah, this is one of the use flows in my imagination because I, we don't have much um, research on res use cases at this point, but like um, starting from the search bar, you enter an item you are trying to search. And there's this drop down menu of the corrected terminology. And then you, for example, you're trying to search some papers on this terminology and then you hit this articles and it pops into this web page and then in this filters categories you can like filter your results by for example regions years and all kind of filters you guys you guys were talking about earlier and then this could be the search results and under here there is some uh, mention items that is related to this article. And then from there, you can jump into the 
graph search categories. And this is an interface more like Lion project um, that it shows the maps of all these uh, relations of the terminologies. And for example, you click on this terminology and then there is this uh, introductions of this terminology. And from there you can go from, uh, click on this search article saying it, it can lead you back to the article search. So yeah, this too, it was kind of like uh, connected. I think the this looks great, by the way, this interaction okay. flow. And uh, I think the the step that should we should think about a little bit more is how you know clicking on the items doesn't necessarily mean this is a new search, but more like hey, I'm actually interested not in just angiotensin receptors, but in you know uh, the renin angio uh, system overall, or like uh, some enzymes or receptor <coughs> blockers or things like that. And this way, it kind of broadens the search. So this part should ideally happen some somewhere in here. As so, instead of sending them into two different workflows, we should assume that they click search, they see search results, but also they have ability to expand a graph. Maybe like a small graph is showcased here, or maybe here on the left, and then they click on it. It expands and they can click on more of the things to expand the search to different uh, related items. And that way we also give them filters to narrow it down. Yeah, that could be. And uh, what will be inside the filters? And say what? You cut off. What will be inside of filters block? Yeah, so inside of filters, there should be definitely the study type to begin with, the source, the um, all kinds of uh, things that pertain to specific um, type of study type. So if it's clinical trial, there should be sample size filter, there should be age filter, and basically dynamic filters that are based on the direction of research. And also the filters that will be relevant to the actual related items so mm -hmm. and this these yeah these fellows kind of go back to this sort of collections idea that's been described or this idea of like somebody who's interested in the genetics of it would have filters related to the genetics and somebody who's interested in the medicine or like the treatment would be you know there'd be maybe more treat like filters around drug types or drug groups or Exactly, or, and there should be a bottom. Organs being affected, or we're, we're going to have to work out a lot of different filters in that space. But then filters, to a certain extent, should be, um, like I said, a dynamic, depending on the profile that someone picks when they're coming in, or the the direction of research that they're looking at should inform. And I mean, I still think the idea of profiles will be an interesting way of making like people's yeah. life a little easier. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think what we can start with is basically making sure that this is not just, you know, search results, but more specific, like outline. This is a search for angiotensin receptors, uh, blah, blah, blah. So that way they can save the search and it will save it as a collection or something like clinical trials from China uh, that mention angiotensin in abstract and uh, something like that. And that way they can share this collection on Twitter and other researchers yeah, and then can... exactly all the people can go straight to that set that's yep. been mm -hmm. made and uh, i actually asked question about filters because uh, this mock-up uh, looks like few find if you don't know what few find is it's open source uh, search engine and uh, i think it's used for also for cataloging systems what's the name be few find few yes uh one second hey. Put it in the chat. Uh, let me check. Something goes wrong. No, few v u. A few. V u v v i e. V u has to look yeah. or something. I I've got the link inside of. Uh, can, can you click oh. on it? <laughs> I am oh. terrible. Okay, that one. 
that, that I want to spell that because it's not a word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we'll okay. find. Can you just just click on on chat and you will directly uh, open it? This one. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, so type something or go. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that well, this this is going to probably go into our competition so or competitive can, analysis of different things. We, we can just get it out of the box and uh, we can Let's do it in, in infrastructure and uh, fill with our um, co uh, coordinating papers. Let's and, do it. Uh, we can use it as a basis. Is this is this infrastructure like is this open source infrastructure that we could like inter integrate into the system? Yeah, I think that's what is it, Slava is mentioning. Is this, so this is another tool that we could integrate into the whole collection of tools. Yep, wow. open source library. Let's do it. I think that do would it. be a great baseline. <clears throat> this is going to be so stitched together with so many different <laughs> ideas. But that's why it's well, beautiful. But the, but that's the clever thing, yeah. It's, it's using all these tools that exist that people just haven't put them all together to solve a problem. I mean, there is there is a saying, of, oh, something along the lines of like, you know, you take, uh, like, something along the lines of people are not really original. You just sort of like take ideas from other people and you just kind of make it better uh, or you combine. Everything's. Them. I think the the term, the term is everything is a remix. Yeah. <laughs> Every everything is a remix of somebody else's idea. Nothing's very few things are original. At least, well, in, at least in that we're not pretending. We're just open, open source in this. Open source discovery tool. That that's exactly it. That's amazing. Yeah, and we, this is something we're using for I think like, let me think like ten years already. <laughs> no nice. Why didn't tool. you mention it before? <laughs> Come on, I, I, I just see mockups that looks like <laughs> viewfinds. <laughs> that's great. All right, we're we're making some progress. I, yeah, well, I I'll it. just go in. I'll go into as competitive analysis, and yeah, how do they? How does that search engine work? How can we improve on it? How can we edit it? How can we make it work as well as possible? Nice. And right. if I'm not mistaken, uh, so only thing we need to do uh, just to export everything as Mark Twenty One standard of uh, Library of Congress, and after uh, there is kind of automatic ingest inside of viewfind so it will not take too much time to get it up and running this coordinating collection sounds beautiful sounds good all right so we have we still have 10 minutes and i I'll, I'll take a moment to showcase the draft of user stories that uh darshan started so kind of structuring it in a more formal uh agile scrum uh, user stories and outlining the specific uh, type of the story, epic or uh, a user story, and uh, bringing more details to how the functionality should work. So I think, Nicole, this should be very useful to you um, in terms of structuring use cases, because essentially your format is kind of similar to this one, but I think those are complementary because the first one is more for like actual researchers, and this one is more for developers to start, um, you know, developing and improving the tool. So this link is in Slack. I recommend um, everyone to check it out. And I hope uh, Darshan will, will share permissions for commenting. And he's probably asleep now because he's in, in India, but looking forward to that. So the next item on the agenda is the actual roadmap and the Trello board that Bianca created. And she broke it down into our standard kind of, uh, you know, resources goes at first. We have recordings of the calls in here. We have um, info sheet that displays, uh, explains the nature of the project. We have the summary created by Kathy here. We have some assumptions, wireframing. Uh, Which is something we need to, yeah, the formula assumptions is kind of where we're at now. Like wireframe prototype is fine, but we need to make sure we get the assumptions right, and we also need to not really assume. <laughs> we need to assume as little as possible and actually get evidence as much as possible, which is where we need to actually get some real user research. I know we've got some of it from calls, and we need to 
Yeah, we need to formalize. We need to, have a few people, we need to have a few people sitting down and just going through the calls and pulling the actual details out and putting it into a space that we can all sort of see rather than five people For, having it around in the red. Fortunately, we have no shortage of calls. It's <laughs> no, it's all recorded, like, just about. Yeah. All right. So and I mean, then I mean I I've started a mirror board and I'm just going to start putting loads and loads of links on it and then we can have space for everything to live in one space then we can have one big visual board with all the different ideas floating around rather than 10 different projects in 10 different spaces cuz that's just going to make everyone's yeah. life harder. So, you know, uh, all of these cards are definitely just a work in progress and a starting point, but I highly recommend for everyone that is participating on a call now or participating afterwards and listening to this call to join this uh, board and start contributing because this is going to become ultimately the central place for uh, us to, to streamline the, the chaotic nature of our volunteer experience. Should we give anyone a few minutes to give a chance to give a bit of an introduction if they're new? Or if yeah, I actually, like I, I, feel I feel that, like that's a good idea. Yeah, I agree. So with Nicole, Yuan, Peter, they're all new names to me. I mean, I, I can go first, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so hi, everyone. If, I, if you didn't get the chance to meet me or talk to me, my name is Nicole. Um, I graduated from UC Berkeley uh, last year with a degree in architecture uh, with UN. Um, but I would say the past two years I've been trying to transition to the UX um, design industry. So I have participated in a couple of uh, stu um, student school projects um, regarding the whole like, UX design process and the product design process. Um, but I don't have any like working experience yet, which is why, you know, uh, why I want to participate in this volunteer opportunity and um, I can't wait to, you know, bring what I know and also to learn from you all. So, yeah. <laughs> so, hey guys, my name's Yuan, and um, I'm a classmate of Nicole in UC Berkeley. So we kind of share the same background besides um, at the even more beginning phase of exploring UX design now. Yeah, so very glad to learn from you guys. That's great. Oh. Maybe I could say something. Um, I've just Absolutely. been looking at the background. Um, I, it's, it was very confusing because like we have another Andrew and I was like, is that Andrew? I haven't seen Andrew in months if it's Andrew, but it's a different Andrew, so that's fine. Yeah, that's the problem with a common name. I'm Andrew Johnson. Um, I am an NLP data scientist at a tech startup in Chicago, and I'm a classmate. I don't know if you've interacted with uh, Svetlana Chistakova, but oh, yeah. she's the one who mentioned yeah, Corona yeah. Y to me. Um, I'm still kind of new to it, so I'm just kind of learning the context and um, hoping to speak with someone who knows more about the uh, the NLP tasks and what needs to be done still. I don't know if I'm uh, like Vyacheslav, you'd be the person to talk to, or I think you mentioned someone named Mike Honey. Maybe I'll reach out to him. Uh, Mike Honey is visualization mostly, but he's very technical, so he knows it. Um, yeah. Slava, as we call him. Alice, is, I think, is, is a good person is, for you. And if, is, he's, infra he's mostly infrastructure and data, but I, I'm assuming he's got a decent understanding of the NLP stuff. But yeah, yeah Alex. I can use a bit of help. <laughs> Alex, um, Alex, Dan Sosa, and um, Maya are all running different teams, and they're all doing some version of Neuralink, uh, natural language processing in some form because they're all kind of well, feeding into the There is also Kevin Lee here on the call that uh, I think oh, would Kevin be Lee, yeah. beneficial because he was working primarily on engrams and all kinds of like things that we're slowly integrating into the system. So yeah, I think Alex, Kevin, Anton, Slava are definitely the names to, to follow and think. I mean, if you, if, you, if you reach out to me, I can give you some channels that are good places to go to. If not, if you don't want to go, I have to go digging through all the channels because there's there's a lot. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of channels. Thank you. Andrew, um, did you get the chance to have an info dump for me? So, <laughs> yeah. Actually, well, yeah, so some interesting tasks. So uh, please uh, just uh, go to our channel and I will explain what, what, what uh, we want to do. Because we also have some historical sources now and it would be nice to test our pipeline 
on some historical data. So when you say your channel, sorry, what channel are you referring to? Okay, so um, I own Slack, right? Yeah, yeah, we can take this like off. Uh, I don't want to like use up the meeting time with this. I okay. can message you directly. Okay. 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 Um, anybody else got any questions or anything they want to bring to the pie? Yeah, Peter Manley introduced himself. Um, just a quick heads up. His microphone is not working, but he's a sales and business development professional of close to a decade of experience that transitioned to UX design starting about a year ago. Uh, very much needed person on our, our team. So I'm very excited to have you, Peter. And yeah, he was in a he was in a UX call with uh, where I were another day, and I was talking, and he joined. He, he reached out, and, we, uh, and he found the project and joined up. Which oh, nice. Really happy, nice. Yeah, I'm I'm talking about it a lot. I'm not gonna lie. So <laughs> it's literally forty percent of the conversations I have on webinars, and I'm in a webinar four times a week of some kind. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So yeah, uh, we still have two minutes. I'll wrap it up with um, basically a note that the only thing we haven't discussed is the high level roadmap for the next four weeks an expected measure of success. And funding. Oh uh, yeah, and funding is, is another hot topic because it, it's apparent to, to everyone that for us to have this as a focused, laser focused effort, we need to have some level of funding, be it uh, you know, donations or philanthropy type of funding or grants. And Even if it's just for the physical infrastructure to keep getting paid and getting, because it's that's the that's the only major outlay we've got, you know, short of like Zoom and a little bit of yeah. software. So let's let's probably push this discussion into the next call. Um, yeah. I think uh, I'm not sure what's everyone's availability during the weekend. I think I'm gonna try and prompt the call on Sunday just to see if we can capture some of the people that are busy during the week with a, the, you know, a, a normal job. And yeah, let, let's see what happens. Um, I, thought I have an idea. Mm. I can just try to install a few clients in a few days and probably for next week we'll get something to discuss. Let's do it. Okay. Sounds, like Sounds great. How, how is everything going with you, uh, Slava? Are you needing anything or are you just soldiering away at the adding well, projects fine, uh, and, you know, uh, and doing and doing the right open explanation and sorting out the <laughs> APIs and I mean I'm loving the fact that you're like really good at documenting stuff I always appreciate that because I am <laughs> not interested in doing that I really uh, no I, I've got used to do a lot of things in the same time so not yep. big all right um, sounds good guys I think, yeah. I I have to jump on another call, but this has been uh, amazing. And um, I actually feel we uncovered and discovered a lot of things uh, to work on. So yeah, very excited. Yeah, I've joined in the um, the Figma project. I'll have a look at that and I'll try and integrate all the different things into one big mural board and we can start like ideating on plans into one space rather than it being in five or 10 or all the places. We can start summarizing information in one space and start getting some of the uh, the insights that we've already got from calls into um, something that we can understand and tangibly make make yep. plans on. Sounds like a plan. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.